Greetings and welcome to the Cancer Interviews podcast. I'm your host, Bruce Morton. You know, once one survives a cancer journey, another journey begins. On this episode, we are going to hear from a woman with a wealth of information on how one can optimize their survivorship through sound dietary practices. She is Kathy Lehman of Chicago, Illinois. And Kathy, welcome to Cancer Interviews. Thank you so much, Bruce. It's good to be here with you. Thank you. And it's great to have you with us, Kathy. And it is our custom when we start out. We just want to find a little bit more about you, exclusive of your cancer journey. So if you would tell us a little bit about where you're from, what you do for work, and when time allows, what you do for fun. Okay. Well, I am originally from central Illinois, but I migrated north to Chicago many years ago. And this is my, my roots are in the center of the state, but this is where I reside up north. And we have really terrible weather. So, I'll, you know, we have that. Um, I also, lo- you know, in my, I work a lot. I, I really work to, um, to help my breast cancer survivorship community. So that takes a lot of my time. But when I'm not doing that, I love to cook. I am a, a fitness fanatic. It's how I manage stress and all sorts of things, sort through things in my mind. I love to read. And um, I'm actually, not many people know this, but I'm learning how to play the banjo, which is really tricky because I'm a lefty, so everything's backwards and upside down, but um, I have a left-handed banjo and I'm working on that, so that's fun. Now, we are going to get into the enormous piece that is part of your life that uh, pertains to your being a dietitian and personal trainer and the organization you've started called Health Rebuild, but that was preceded by your own cancer journey, a cancer journey with breast cancer. So we want to address that first. Kathy, at what point did you notice that something wasn't quite right, that something needed medical attention? Well, actually, I did not notice it. I was at a wellness, my annual wellness visit with my general practitioner, and she noticed. So it was not, it was something I overlooked. And, and what happened after your general practice, uh, your, your GP noticed it? Well, she called it to my attention and she asked me if what she was um, seeing seemed normal, quote unquote normal. And I said, I really, honestly, I, I don't know. And I, she said, okay, well, I just thought I'd mention it. I got dressed. I went to work, um, worked all day, came home, didn't even think about it really again until the next morning when I got out of the shower and then I thought, I wonder what she was talking about. And then I saw what she was referencing. And you know, that saying that ice runs through your veins, that's literally what it felt like. I'm not kidding, nor exaggerating. And then we were off to the races with all the follow up to that. Now, different cancers present people with, uh, with options and, and some are not presented with options. Did you have treatment options? And if so, what were they? Well, I really didn't have to have, I was fortunate in that I didn't have to have a number of options. Gratefully, my pathology was really good and my cancer was non-aggressive. It was low grade. It was not in my lymph nodes, um, stage one. So I have no family history, which is common for breast cancer. But I really, I, I just essentially had one straight path because it was a pretty straightforward cancer. Although I did get a second opinion just so for my own peace of mind, but it was really pretty straightforward. I had a lumpectomy and I had radiation and then I did five years of hormone therapy medication. And what would you say was the toughest part of that journey? Uh, All of it, but I would say the most difficult part for me of the breast cancer experience was, well, it was twofold. One, it was actually, um, as I'm sure it is with every other cancer survivor, it's coming face to face with the reality of it, like not resisting reality, because it just didn't fit for me on any level. I was super fit. I had just run the Chicago Half Marathon seven weeks before my diagnosis. as healthy as could be, no family history, as I mentioned. So the reality of it, I was really um, doing my best to resist that. So that was tough. And the other side was telling my family. That was 
that was challenging because I don't live near my fam my immediate family. So, you know, I don't see them regularly. So it was really just, that was a difficult conversation. Your family, to what degree did it figure into your cancer journey as uh, a source of support? Well, my, my family is pretty much all in central Illinois, and a couple of them are just in other areas of the country. My husband's family is here in the Chicago area. So um, obviously, I had support from everyone. It was just varying levels of support, sort of based on geography. <laughs> so yeah, and friends, of course. But I was really private about my breast cancer, so I didn't share it with many people at all, essentially immediate family and just a few close friends. So it wasn't I was not out on social media posting all of the steps of my experience, and that's just not my thing. Um, and I wouldn't have felt comfortable with that. So I had a, a small but very, um, very strongly supportive community around me. Now, early detection certainly helped, I suspect, in your cancer journey. And there must have been a time, Kathy, there must have been a juncture in which you felt you were getting the upper hand on it. What was that like? You know, I never felt like I, like cancer had the upper hand. I, this may sound odd, but I was not one of those breast cancer patients who thought I was going to die or that it was going to kill me. I was just so angry about the whole thing that I thought, you know, nothing can penetrate this anger. I'm, it's, it's just, it's kind of like a protective layer that had wrapped around me. And I don't normally lead from anger. It was just, just such a, that's a whole nother story, but it's one of the reasons the blog that I write is called damn mad about breast cancer. Let's just we'll start. We'll put that over there. But I, I didn't feel like cancer had the upper hand. I think also because my pathology was so good. And every time I got the results of, um, you know, my biopsy and my scans and my lab value, all of them were so favorable that it, it bolstered my faith in the fact that I was going to be okay um, getting through it. So that's really what I held on to. So I really didn't, I never really felt like cancer had an upper hand or I didn't even really think about it like that, but that's an interesting question. Our guest is Kathy Lehman of Chicago. And if you like what you hear in this segment, we invite you to subscribe to our podcast by clicking the links below. Once there, you will see a bell icon. And if you click on that, we will notify you anytime we post a new interview. Now, Kathy, you are a dietitian. You're a personal trainer. What inspired you to meld those skills with your cancer journey? Well, at the time of my diagnosis, I was running my business called NutriFit. Nutrition, fitness combined. And I had had my business since just before 2000. And I was in private practice as a, as a dietitian and nutrition therapist. I, was, I had a private personal training studio where I had a staff of trainers working with me. And I did corporate wellness education for businesses, organizations around the Chicago area and beyond. So my entire career was devoted to using nutrition and fitness and lifestyle behaviors to reduce risk of illness, to keep people out of the hospital. I've never worked as a clinical dietitian because my goal was always to keep people out of the hospital. The irony is not lost on me. Um, you know, preventive tactics, managing medical conditions with nutrition and lifestyle. So that was always my focus. And that's exactly what I was doing at the time of my diagnosis. And so I continued to run my business for a few years. And then just through a progression of changes, um, in, you know, status of like the lease in my brick and mortar training studio and such, I just started thinking about, you know, how I could help in use my professional experience and blend it with my personal experience to help other women who had gone through what I'd gone through, because I, I started to just kind of peek around in the world of breast cancer, which I was not my world before, of course. And I noticed that there were a lot of gaps in that community education wise and information wise that I could fill with my knowledge and my experience. And I was really fortunate before I headed into my treatment, I called one of my dietitian friends who worked in oncology, told her what was going on, asked her if she could sit down with me because I just had, I knew enough to know what I didn't know. And I, I wanted to make sure I was on 
track with what I was thinking in terms of my nutritional care while I was going through treatment. And not everyone has that available to them. So I just thought, how could I blend all this and help after? And I also felt like being able to help other women would help me make my cancer make sense to me. It was also a way to sort of start to heal psychologically and just um, on so many other levels. So it's just been a slow, but pretty straightforward with a few detours uh, transition. So you had the foundation for this great idea, but now that you had this great idea, you needed um, sort of a, a, a brick and mortar related bucket list to address. What were the things that you had to do to make your venture called Health Rebuild, which we'll talk about um, some more, we're gonna elaborate on that, but to, to get Health Rebuild from a good idea to reality, what did you need to do? Yeah, so initially, uh, Health Rebuild is relatively new, and I love that we're gonna talk about that, but initially, what I, I didn't know what to do. I thought, I don't know how, I'm gonna, how this is gonna look. I have a thriving business. I sort of crashed and burned the business without having a solid plan to move into, but I just, I kept my, um, you know, I just, I started writing the blog, the Damn Mad About Breast Cancer blog, and I just started writing to all of the nutritional and fitness issues that I saw women talking about out there, you know, in on social media. And I started um, creating some little programs about breast cancer nutrition. And I really initially thought I would focus on women who are newly diagnosed and getting them prepared to head into treatment. But I found that that was just, you know, you're so focused on just getting through treatment. You can't, you don't have a lot of bandwidth for other things. So, um, you know, I really just sort of tried on a few things and essentially through doing that trial and error and seeing what was missing out there in the world of, like I said, a breast cancer survivorship, it really helped me start to formulate where I could best serve. And it's really a work in progress is putting Health Rebuild together and starting to move that out into the world. It's really based on just huge gaps that I see in the survivorship space for support from a health and lifestyle and nutrition standpoint. Kathy, if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like all of us who have some kind of involvement with cancer will always stress the importance of early detection. But it sounds like getting out in front of cancer from a dietary standpoint can help as well. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yeah, yes. And I, and I hesitated with that is because I kind of work from both sides of my brain. You know, I always say both sides of my brain being the before cancer side and the after cancer side. And, you know, before cancer, I was working with clients who did not have cancer. Some of my clients had had breast cancer. I had a handful of them, but um, that wasn't my focus. I'm not an oncology dietitian. I'm a lifestyle dietitian. And so now in this space, it's really about taking the best care of yourself with nutrition and physical activity and self-care practices. And so cancer or no, and all types of cancer can benefit from taking the best care of ourselves. So, and, and I say that because the one caveat to that is you can eat the healthiest diet on the planet and it, there's no guarantee that you won't get cancer. But what we use nutrition for in the cancer oncology world or nutrition oncology world is optimizing outcomes through treatment, um, you know, supporting recovery and then long-term health over survivorship. So that's really the focus. And it's not, a, it's never a bad idea to take the best care of yourself that you can ever. It's never a bad idea. Now your, your platform health rebuild, if you were to identify it's, uh, it's top goals. I'm sure there are many goals and sub goals, but uh, what would you say the top goal of Health Rebuild is? Well, it's really, you know, it's, it, it's a survivorship program that helps women move forward with courage and clarity and confidence in their nutrition and lifestyle choices. And this is after treatment for hormone-driven breast cancer. I specialize in that particular area because that was a type of cancer I had. It's what most women have. It's the most common type, and it's um, there are some nuances to that that I'm very comfortable with. So the goal of that for these women who've gone through that, they're terrified of food. 
They don't trust their body to go back to the level of physical activity they were at before cancer, or if they weren't at any level of physical activity, get started again. And they're just really not sure how to take charge of their health in order to you know, move into a healthy survivorship. So the goal is really to help them conquer that food fear so that they can eat without stress and anxiety and guilt. It's also to help them regain their energy, stamina and strength so they can do the, you know, get back to the things they enjoy with the people they love. And it's also to help them just take, like I said, take charge and rebuild their health so that they can feel confident that they're doing everything they can to be as healthy as possible. I like to say, you know, we, there's no guarantee about recurrence. I mean, that's the biggest fear for, I think, anyone who's had cancer, but especially in the breast cancer world, a fear of recurrence or another breast cancer is terrifying. And so the low hanging fruit is grabbing onto the diet. You know, I should, shouldn't eat this, or I probably should have had more of that. And that becomes a little bit of an obsession. And so I always say, you can't guarantee that anything you do healthy lifestyle wise will prevent that, but you can always meet it halfway. And so the goal of health rebuild is to help women feel that they're doing everything they can to meet that risk halfway. And then it gives them sort of this peace of mind that they're like, okay, I've done what I can do. And now, you know, that's the best I can do. And it gives them some, just this level of peace that I think is so important to reduce and eliminate the anxiety and the guilt and the stress. Now, in doing a little research about Health Rebuild, I noticed three key areas you want to address, and I want to go over each one and give you a chance to elaborate on each. The first one is rebuild your health. It sounds like you've addressed that to some degree, but if you could elaborate on that a little bit more as as to what are the components that go into rebuild your health? Yeah, sure. So I, you know, nutrition and fitness, I always say they're both sides of the same coin. And they're also part of the foundation of what helps you rebuild your health. You know, nutrition, or excuse me, cancer is a cellular disease. It's a metabolic disease at the cellular level. And all, nutrition is a science. And I always like to remind people that, that it's not an opinion. I mean, you can have an opinion about your diet or food. You could say, I, I am not a fan of broccoli. That's an opinion, but that's not the science of broccoli. And so nutrition science is really looking at how food works in our body to support health or, you know, minimize our health. And so um, rebuilding your health, I always say starts in the kitchen, starts with your fork, your knife, your plate, and it starts either at the gym or your stationary bike or your treadmill or walking outside. It's really about those two things, but combined with mindset and mindfulness and getting momentum to get started and keep going and then a maintenance level so that you continue lifelong. That's what I call the foundational six of rebuilding your health. You know, you look at your nutrition, you look at your fitness or physical activity level, and then you need these other pieces to support that. And so rebuilding your health really requires all of those working collectively to support you moving forward uh, from the healthiest place that you can be. Kathy, you've established some connective tissue between uh, physical health that comes with uh, diet and exercise and one's mental health. But one of your other touchstones is calm your anxiety. Could you elaborate on that, please? Yeah. Well, cancer is all about anxiety. I think you <laughs> could probably can relate to that. And so in my previous work, when I was uh, running my, you know, my private practice, I did a lot of eating disorder work, disordered eating, unhealthy relationships with food. And so I was so fascinated by that, that I went back and got my graduate degree in health psychology, because I love the connection of food and mood and, and why we eat the reasons we eat that have nothing to do with food or hunger, or excuse me, nothing to do with hunger. And so the anxiety that comes from can breast cancer can often trigger using food in ways or exercise or both in ways that are seemingly helpful in calming anxiety, but they're really not. And so it's really about, you know, it, figuring out triggers and how triggers in your life, cancer is a trigger for anxiety and trauma and stress and not using exercise, food, nutrition, your diet as ways to cope. So managing anxiety with mindfulness practices, 
self-care, really being intentional and aware of, you know, what your thoughts are and, and how that impacts your behavior. Those are all connected. And it's just such a critical point to, or critical piece to managing all of that. Now, the third item that I noticed with Rebuild Health is something that sounds so simple, and yet I suspect it can be quite complex. And uh, this is your chance to elaborate on that. And that is very simply, well, perhaps it's not simple, but, uh, but the talking point is do what's best. Ah, it's simple, but it's not easy. So if you can imagine, which I'm sure you can, Bruce, um, all of the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis that make you feel your best, like getting enough sleep, drinking enough water, limiting how much TV you sit in front of, TV time or screen time that you, you have, um, getting to bed on time, getting in physical activity, eating food that makes you feel good rather than making you feel just physically uncomfortable, eating enough, not, you know, not eating to excess constantly to try to block out the rest of the things that are going on in your world that are so negative. All of the things that we do to help us make or that help us feel our best are not always the easiest thing to do because we, you know, and I'm not talking about being perfect. I am not, that's not what I'm suggesting. I'm just saying even a couple things every day that you do that make you feel your best can be difficult to do. So it's really about learning how that the daily actions and behaviors and habits, what I call health rebuild habits, learning which ones make you feel optimal, and then figuring out how to make those be a consistent part of your life, regardless of what's going on, whether you're traveling, whether you're having a sick day, or whether you are, it's a celebration or a holiday for the rest of your life, 365 days a year. I kind of look at it as a health rebuild 365. How are you managing? Because, you know, we're really good at one week being on target with eating food that makes us feel great, getting our activity, getting our sleep, and then something will happen and a couple of weeks will go by and we've abandoned all of that. And then we have to start all over. We tend to be all or nothing. So it's really about doing what's best, identifying it, making it work for you in a sustainable way. But, you know, everybody can do anything for a day or two, but can you take good care of yourself lifelong? That's always the challenge. Now, you had talked about a certain type of food and whether somebody thinks it's good or bad is an opinion, but yours is a learned opinion. So with respect to dietary things that people should lean toward and those they should perhaps stray away from, what are some of the, what are some of the good things and what are some of the bad things in your view? Well, the first thing that I do, and I'm really picky about this, it's, and this has always been my focus, is when we put food in a good, bad category, it puts us in a good, bad category. So when we say, oh, I'm eating good food today, or I was bad yesterday because I ate French fries, that makes French fries bad. French fries are neutral, but it's what we make them mean <laughs> that it makes them be food that doesn't feel so great in our brain. So I like to leave the good, bad um, labels, put those to the side and just look at what's the food that I always like to say, what's the food you eat that loves you back? What food do you love to eat that loves you back? You know, if you sit down in front of the TV or at a movie or something like that with an enormous bag of anything, candy, snack food, and you eat the whole thing without paying attention, that food, you probably love it, but it's not loving you back because you feel not so great after you have engaged in that that habit. So it's really about not avoiding any foods. It's about paying attention to how much you're having, how often, and why you're eating them. But having said that, there are some recommendations for the healthiest, most optimal diet for breast health and any other health. And that's plant-based, which does not mean vegan or vegetarian, by the way, but plant-based, um, you know, eating food as close to its original natural whole um, to self as you can, it's origin, you know, the original food, um, and really just, you know, focusing on, it's very easy now to just grab and go with food. It's easy to have enormous portions of food served to us that we eat without really thinking. We clean our plate and it's a plate that could probably serve us four meals. So it's really about just being intentional and staying focused and understanding what food works best for you. So we, we, 
We hear that the term every once in a while, quote unquote, love yourself. This looks like a variation of love yourself. Well, you know, I always say, if you love yourself, don't you deserve to give yourself the best food that makes you feel the best and move your body regularly, give yourself enough sleep, keep yourself hydrated. I mean, I, I have had the experience of working with clients in the past who take better care of their animals in terms of their animals' nutrition and their animals' care than they do for themselves. And I find, because I work primarily with women, it's not that I don't work with men, but more women than men get breast cancer, of course, and that tends to be my client base. Women are not always so great at self-care. They put themselves last. They put everyone else first. They feel like they don't deserve being taken care of. If there's extra money lying around, they'll spend it on their kids or their animals or their husband before they spend it on themselves. So it, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of mindset around taking the best care of yourself, even recognizing that you deserve it and that valuing your, that your, your health is valuable. I, that's a lot of the work that I do is helping women understand it's okay to take care of yourself and you can't take care of anyone else if you don't take care of yourself first. And so to your point, that is a huge, huge component of rebuilding your health is really loving yourself and taking the best care of yourself because you deserve it. Our guest is Kathy Lehman of Chicago. And Kathy, before we go any farther, we're about to wrap up, but I do want people to know about how they can access what you're doing. So if you would, Give us the, uh, the web address for Health Rebuild and any other information they would need for Health Rebuild. And uh, if you would give us the particulars about your blog one more time. Sure, absolutely. So you can find me and my um, Health Rebuild program at my website, which is kathyleeman.com. It's Kathy with a C. It's L-E-M-A-N, kathyleeman.com. I am on Instagram. That's where I'm most active. And my handle there is hormone.breastcancer.dietitian. And my blog, my Damn Mad About Breast Cancer blog, that is the URL. It's D-A-M-M-A-D about breast cancer, damnmadaboutbreastcancer.com. Now, we begin our interviews from pretty much the same place, and we like to end from pretty much the same place. And we usually end with about the same question. Kathy, if, if you encountered somebody face-to-face, or face-to-face over Zoom or over the telephone, email or whatever. But if you had a private audience with somebody who had just been diagnosed, they just found out that they're gonna be embarking on a journey of breast cancer or some other type of cancer, and you didn't have all day, you had a limited amount of time, and out of all the things that you might wanna say to this person, if you could pick one overarching point, what would it be? I would stress that they will get through the experience of breast cancer. They'll get through it. Secondly, I would stress that there's a continuum of a breast cancer diagnosis. There's that initial diagnosis time, there's that in-treatment time, and then there's that post-treatment survivorship. And within that continuum, how you feel in your mind and in your heart and in your body, it's going to shift. And even living with metastatic breast cancer, some women are diagnosed at right out at the start with metastatic breast cancer, you know, anywhere in that continuum, things will ebb and flow and just be patient with yourself and give yourself grace and recognize that you've just got to, the only way through it is to go through it and you can't avoid it and you can't avoid the reality like I tried to do because that will not serve you. Wonderful. Kathy, thanks so much. We had mentioned at the top that you were going to be sharing a wealth of information, and that's exactly what you did. So, Kathy Lehman, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for being with us on Cancer Interviews. Thank you so much, Bruce. It was my pleasure. And that's going to wrap up this edition of Cancer Interviews. We want to remind you that as you make your way down a cancer journey, or if you know somebody who is, you are not alone. There are people like Kathy out there who have a an abundance of information that can help you in every imaginable way to get through your cancer journey. So until next time, we'll see you on down the road. Thanks for joining us today. For more information, please visit us online at cancerinterviews.com. We appreciate you tuning in, and we'll see you back here again next time on the Cancer Interviews Podcast.